friends, my name is Femke and welcome back to a new video on my channel. Today is a very exciting video because this is the first episode of this new series I'm going to be doing called The Classics Club, which is a series where we'll talk all about classic literature Every single video will be about classics. I thought this series would be really fun to create kind of a space for lovers of classic literature to come together, but, but at the same time to welcome readers who are new to reading classic literature and might not be sure where to start or who just want to be part of the conversation or who might find classics really intimidating and want to learn how they can approach classics in a different light to make them less intimidating. Because really classic literature it's so much fun and I think everyone could enjoy classics so I just wanted to create a little space to talk about classics and that is the classics club and this video is the first episode and I thought for the first episode the most perfect thing I could do is create kind of a step-by-step -step guide for how to read a classic. Now, obviously this is not a perfect guide. These are basically just some tips and tricks from me, um, a person who has been reading classics for a while. I also study English literature at university, which obviously doesn't mean that I can create the perfect step-to-step -step guide because reading is such a personal experience, but I can give you some of the tips and tricks, some things that I, might have wanted to know when I started reading classics. So without further ado, let's get into our little guide. The first step into this progress of starting to read classics is thinking, what do I want to read? Maybe you have a classic in mind that you've been really wanting to get to, but if you don't, then here are some tips for choosing the perfect classic book for you. When people think about classics, I feel like we often think that it is like a genre, but it really isn't. It's kind of a type of book, being books that have stood the test of time and still are still being read, even though they were written long, long times ago. Um, so it's more of a type than a genre, which means that within the classic literature type, there are actually so many different genres to, sh to choose from. And knowing this can really, really help you choose the perfect classic to start with. Because if you're, for example, a romance reader, you might try to look within the romance side or branch of classic literature, and you might be wanting to read something like Jane Austen or Elizabeth Gaston something like that. Maybe you like horror and thriller and mysteries. Well, then I would recommend you read a book like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Frankenstein, Dracula, those kind of things, something gothic. But if you like dystopian, for example, you could read George Orwell or Zamiatin or all of the other classic dystopian authors that are out there. So I would recommend you take a little scroll on the internet, on Goodreads, whatever, and look for classics within a genre that you already know that you like to read from. Or if you want to get into classics, I assume that maybe you are very interested in certain times and eras in history and maybe you would want to read a book from, say, the Victorian era or a book from the 1930s, the Great Depression, something like that, if you're interested in those time periods. So what I'm trying to say is try to really think about something that you already know you will like. Like pick a book that you actually feel excited to read and you actually think you will love. Because after all, reading a classic novel like any other book you read is meant to be enjoyable, really. And it can only be enjoyable if you pick a book that you are actually excited to read. If you have like any certain vibes or genres of or time periods or things that you like in a book and you're looking for a classic, feel free to leave your like specific details of what you're looking for in the comments and I'll try to look with you for a book that you might read. Obviously, I can only recommend the books that I've read, but uh, maybe I can help in your process or if you want me to, I can make a whole video recommending books based on specific genres or whatever. I can definitely get more into that if you want to. So now that you have found your book that you really want to read, you're really excited about, how are you going to go about this? What is very important to realize when you're reading a classic is that it will probably take you longer to finish it than when you're reading a contemporary novel. And therefore, I think it is very helpful to set yourself a realistic 
goal. This can be a time-related goal, so let's say I want to read one hour of this classic every single day, or it can be a page-related goal or a chapter-related goal where you tell yourself I want to read this amount of pages, this amount of chapters every single day or every other day, or whatever. I think having a daily goal or a bi-daily goal or whatever, just a a small goal for yourself related to the book you're reading, obviously, is really helpful for some motivation because it can feel like kind of like a challenge. You want to do it every day. You've, you've challenged yourself to read this amount of pages every day, let's say 50 pages of this book every day, so you want to do it and you're gonna do it every single day. But it also gives you some perspective on how long it will take you to finish a book and I think just knowing when you want to have the book finished is just really helpful to keep you going, if that makes sense. Um, but at the same time, just know that it is going to take you a longer time, probably at least, um, to finish a classic than it would for you to finish the books you're already reading, contemporary, whatever. I think a daily goal would just be a very good motivation to keep you going. Because here on the internet, what seems to be really important is the amount of books you read. We are all so obsessed with how many books we've read each month and our Goodreads reading goal. And even though those things are really fun, it's fun to read a lot, taking your time for a book is equally as important in my opinion and I just I think it is very important when you're starting a classic to realize that this is going to take some time but there is no rush you don't have to prove anything to anyone like reading challenges are fun but they shouldn't keep you from reading a classic if you want to read a classic just because it might take you a longer time to finish it um, but if you do like that little challenge to keep you excited, to keep you going, I do think a realistic goal, maybe a daily goal, is very fun and honestly don't overdo it. Like setting daily goals, really good, but make them achievable because I think if they're not achievable, you're just gonna end up being really frustrated. Um, what can really help is to just read it for a day and see how much you can easily get through. And then based off of that first reading experience of a classic, set your other goals for the rest of your time reading it, I guess. But moral of the story, take the time you need. There is no rush to finish this book. Even if it takes you months, even if it takes you years, if you wanna get through a certain book and you're enjoying it, then it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get through it. Now let's go to the third step in our guide. This comes down to your actual reading experience. I think a lot of people when they start reading classics are scared that they are not gonna get it. And this is something I hear so often, but in reality, like there is only so much to get from a classic novel. I think you'll always understand it in some way or other. Um, classics tend to have a lot of layers, a lot of subtext, and there is a lot to them, truly. There, usually there's just so much to get from it, but at the same time, classics are also just really enjoyable, even if you don't fully 100% understand everything. Um, and for example, when I read my first classics, if I look back on those books now, I realized that probably if I were to reread them now, I would look at them differently and I would get different things out of them and I would see different meanings, different layers, different symbolism, different motifs, like just different things. But that is okay and it's normal that after your first classic book you wouldn't feel comfortable to write like a whole paper about it or whatever. But you don't have to, like, you don't have to study English literature to enjoy a classic. Like, they're just really enjoyable, they're really fun, even if you don't study literature and if you don't know every single aspect or how to analyze literature. Like, it's fun without having to analyze it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. However, my best tip for actually understanding what you are reading is to make a little summary. The way I go about it when I read a book for university, I must admit, I don't always do this. Like I almost never do this when I read a book for myself, 
But when I do read a book for university, I obviously want to remember the plot a little better than uh, when I read a book for myself. Definitely if I'll have to write a paper on it or study for my exam, I want to know where in the book certain things happen. And the way I do that is by writing down after I finish a chapter, at the bottom of the chapter or at the chapter heading, just write down a couple of key words that describe what happens in the chapter. And I do this to keep track of the book, to later on go back into the book and know when certain things happen. But it can also be useful when you're new to reading classics to write down what the chapter is about, first of all, to just remember it better, but also to take a moment to think, like, do I actually know what just happened? Do I know what I read or do I not? Because you're not gonna enjoy a book if you don't know what's happening. Which I know that sounds contradictory to what I just said about not having to know all of the meanings, but I'm talking like plot-wise, events, obviously you need to know <laughs> what happens in a book to be able to enjoy it. And sometimes with classics, the language can be a little difficult, so you might not fully always understand everything. But I find that when I finish a chapter and I reflect on what happened in that chapter, I can really realize, did I understand it or did I not? Like, do I know what happens? Or do I need to reread it? Do I need to do some research and look it up? There's no shame to looking things up online if you don't fully understand. So writing down the keywords is, on top of remembering it well, a way to reflect and see if you really did understand the plot, because the plot is important in the book obviously. And this is what I do for when I read books for university and I need to be able to quickly see where certain things happen. And it's also interesting at the end when you finish the book, you can go back through it and like compare the start to the finish and just take in the book as a whole, I guess. It's just something that I like to do, but honestly, you do with that what you will. <laughs> And this brings me to the topic of annotating, because I guess technically writing down keywords is already annotating. By the way, what I do want to say about that is that you don't have to write it in your book if you don't want to, like you can keep a little notepad next to you or type it down in like a Word document or whatever, like if you want to keep track of the chapters but you don't want to write in the book or you don't have the space to write it out in the book, you can do it somewhere else, obviously. But this brings me to the topic of annotating. Um, this is something a lot of people do to help them understand classic literature, but they do it, so many people do it with non-classics too, because a lot of people find that annotating really helps to get into the story, dissect the story, analyze the story, understand the story or the book. And even though I am personally a big fan of annotating, I'm not going to tell you that you have to annotate when you're reading a classic, because you can definitely understand a classic and love a classic without annotating it. Again, it's just about your preferences. It's what you're looking for in the book. Do you just want to read the story and enjoy it? Do you want to analyze it? Whatever. Like, just think about your reason for reading a classic and based on that, kind of see, do I want to annotate? Do I not want to annotate? If you do want to annotate, I'm going to very quickly show you how, basically how my annotation has progressed throughout the years from when I just started to now, to, just to give you some ideas on how you could annotate if you would choose to do so. If you want to see an in-depth video on how I annotate specifically classics, let me know because I can absolutely provide that. I can absolutely make that for you. So here I have a couple of books that I've annotated. The first thing I want to say about annotation is that your annotations do not have to be smart or insightful. They can be literal exclamations like, oh my god, or I love this, or I hate this, or even emojis. I do that. Like, I annotate so silly. Like, my genuine reactions. I'll write down, oh my god, I'll write it down stuff like, same girl. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to be serious. Annotation is just for fun. It's a way to interact with what you're reading, and it doesn't have to be smart <laughs> or insightful. Or educational at all. Or another thing that I really like to do is as I'm reading kind of ask a question relating to what I just read 
but that doesn't mean that I immediately need to know the answer. It's just something as I'm reading, I'll realize something. For example, I'll see a certain sentence and it reminds me of another book and I'll just write down the title of that book with a question mark just for me to then later on maybe research if these books really did get inspiration from each other or are in any way connected, if there's intertextuality going on, kind of like that. Like I pose myself questions for the future which I think is important if you do want to annotate, you don't need answers, <laughs> you don't need to immediately write down like the most clever thought out like uh, little paragraphs, you know, like you could literally just ask a question so that you can later on after you finish the book try and answer that question if that makes sense. Now my annotating, one thing I always do is I always have a pen or a pencil with me, usually a pen, so that I can underline sentences I like and write down my little like exclamations like oh my god and I love this and whatever. That is something that I personally always do with every book I read and I think that is one of the easiest way to annotate, like that's so easy. However, you can make it as complicated as you want. Now let me finally actually run you through these books that I have with me. I wanted to show you my first Victorian classic that I ever read, being North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. As you can see, I have some annotations, some tabs. I did not write in my book yet. I didn't underline, I didn't do any of that. I wrote, like I tabbed with these little colors and I don't even think the colors had a meaning because I don't really have um, a guide here for the colors. So I don't think they have a meaning. What I do have at the back are these two sticky notes. And basically what I did on every little sticky tab Wait, let me show you one. For example, this pink one, I would write down a number. This one is number four. And then at the back, I would write down why I annotated that. Here I wrote a quote which says, will you forgive me? And I thought, I think, I thought that was very romantic. Um, I think that is why I annotated it. But this is a very easy way to annotate. It's just tabbing and then writing down on a sticky note in the back. Most novels have like empty pages at the back where you can stick um, your sticky notes or just like classics often have appendices and other like a lot of a lot of information, a lot of text that you can put your sticky notes on top of. This for me is a very easy way to annotate. You don't have to actually write in your book, which a lot of people might like. I have no problem writing in books, but I know some people do. Um, so that's a very easy way to annotate. Low effort annotation, let's say. However, I also have another book by Elizabeth Gaskell, so by the same author, and having read this one already, I kind of was already familiar with her major themes. So what I did for this book is I kind of anticipated um, the themes that would be in here. So we have, let's say, I have a little guide here at the front. Um, my yellow sticky tabs are for quotes, that's something I almost always do. Orange is for things that make me sad or frustrated. Pink are romantic, love, sweet kind of things. Green is everything having to do with industrial revolution. And blue are like literary things that I'm noticing. And so as you can tell, all of these sticky notes, these are see-through, that's really good. Um, these weren't see-through and now obviously like I can go to the page but literally what I wanted to tab is hidden by the tab and if you have like see-through sticky notes it's obviously not hidden so you can just reread it but I have these kind of annotations and then I would write a little something there I don't know what I wrote here I literally wrote this is so sad for her <laughs> so that's this annotation. This is something you can only do if you already are familiar with the author or if you look up the themes of the book before you start reading, which I would say is actually quite a useful thing if you're getting into a book and you're worried that you won't understand it. Just look up its major themes and then choose a color for each theme and tab it when you see it come through. And this will create kind of like an easy analysis of the book in a way. Um, so that's how I did this one. 
but I definitely don't always do that. Usually I just pick one color sticky note or sticky tab and just have that be my tab for everything that I find interesting in some way which I did for this book. So this has just one color and I still had my pen to underline but then things that were a little extra special uh, that I wanted to really remember I would tap. That's also a way to go about it. And then you can get absolutely crazy and annotate the way I annotated Anna Karenina. I will not get into this but I will tell you this is a book I read two years ago and I've never annotated anything like this like look at all of those annotations like that's crazy that's absolutely crazy um it's it's so full of annotations and I love it but you really don't have to annotate like this I, I just wanted to show it because I love Anna Karenina but you can do this basically this is the same concept as this but it's just a <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts on this one. So yeah, those are just some examples of how I uh, annotate. Let's get these out of the frame actually. <laughs> but again, annotating, decide for yourself. Is this something you want to do? Is this not something you want to do? It's definitely not a must to understand classics or enjoy classics really. However, it does bring me to the topic of research. Do you want to research a book? Or do you not? I have very kind of like perplexed thoughts on researching a book. I understand why you, when you read a classic, would be inclined to already look up a summary or to look up its major themes or different people's opinions or analyses before reading it because it gives you a bit of a starting point. You have some knowledge of the novel going into it, which can be helpful to understand it. However, it also might cloud your own judgment because I feel that when I already have other people telling me what a book is about, I will just take over their opinion and not really think about it for myself anymore and be very critical. Like, do I agree with this? Because reading is so subjective. And that is one of the most important things, if you ask me, to keep in mind when reading a classic. Reading is really subjective. What you get and experience in one book might not be the same as someone else's experience from that same book. And that is okay. So I think doing your research might be fun, might help you, but at the same time, make sure that it doesn't prevent you from creating your own reading experience and your own opinion because classics, as I say, like literature in general, again is subjective and the whole art of it is to find your own opinions. So I really do understand your want to do research on the book because you think like oh it will make it easier for me to understand, to read, but maybe it will just cloud your judgment. So to be fully honest I think there are better ways to make sure you understand what you are reading and I will get to those things in a second but if you do want to research a book I would recommend you do it after you read it because after you finish a book you already have your own opinion on it you had your own experience and now obviously you can research other people's opinions or look up summaries or analyses of other people maybe read some academic papers on the book because that's just really interesting. It's really interesting to get into the discourse around a certain book because one thing about classics, as I've said, is they are a type of book that have stood the test of time. People are still talking about them and it's really fun to become part of that conversation as well. So I think talking to others about a book is really great and doing your research is really great, but try to do it after you finish it. That's just my opinion. Honestly, if you feel more secure, if you feel safer already doing research before you go into the novel, then you do you. Because again, everyone has their own experience. But for me, I just think it would be, it's more fun to experience a book for the first time, not knowing what's gonna happen, um, than already knowing what's gonna happen because you've already done so much research. One thing you can do, obviously, is researching the author 
or the time in which the book is set just to get a little idea or insight into the author's life and times because that might make it easier to understand a book. So that is one thing you could do before reading a book if you do want to feel a bit more secure. And also while you're reading, if you're not really sure you're understanding what's going on, you could use like Spark Notes or any other um, website like that to look for a chapter by chapter summary because that does really help just to make sure you understood what just happened in the chapter. So that might be helpful as well, of course. And then the last little part of this video is some extra tips and tricks and just things that could give you motivation to go on, that could make you understand the book a bit better, um, and just overall some last little tips. My first tip is to watch an adaptation as you read or after you read. One of the great things about classics is that almost all of them have at least one, if not multiple, movie or TV adaptations. And it can be really helpful to watch those as you read. So for example, read a couple of chapters of your book and then treat yourself to watching a bit of a film or movie adaptation up to the point where you've just read. That can be really helpful because it can help you already be able to imagine it a bit more vividly, just recapping it a little bit. Maybe you'll understand it better if you watch a show or a movie adaptation. I did this for Tess of the Durbervilles, which was my first Thomas Hardy novel, and it's one of my favorite books, but at the start it was really difficult for me to get into it. And there was a certain thing that was insinuated, but I didn't fully know if that insinuation was real, like if that truly happened or if it didn't. So what I did is I just watched the first episode of the little BBC miniseries of the Durbervilles and it really helped me understand what was going on and then from there on I just finished the book without watching the miniseries but at least that helped me understand what happened at the start because obviously the start of a book is really important to understand all of the rest, uh, everything that follows. So for me that was really helpful. So maybe an, a, an adaptation might help you as well. Another tip which is very helpful to kind of keep the pacing going is to listen to the audiobook as you read. Some people hate audiobooks, some people really don't like audiobooks, which I think is valid, but if you are an avid audiobook listener, if you just like listening to a story, Classics have been around for a while. Most of them do not belong into the field of copyright anymore. So literally anyone can make an audiobook um, of any classic that has lost its copyright, that is not in the field of copyright anymore. And the good thing about that is that it makes for a lot of free audiobooks, both on Spotify, on YouTube, literally anything, chapter by chapter. So this I think is very easy when you're kind of stuck to maybe listen to it. I recently listened to the audiobook of Jane Eyre while I read it and it was so much fun because Jane Eyre is told in first person perspective and for me it just felt like Jane was talking to me like a friend just talking into my ear and it just made the reading experience even better. So if you know that you like those kind of things, you can do that for classics as well. And then one of my favorite tips is to do a buddy read with a friend. If you have someone else that wants to read the classic that you want to read, this is great because you can keep each other motivated and you can talk about it as you're reading it and make sure you really understand it. You know, again, that discourse with someone else, being able to talk about it, making sure you both understand what's going on. And if you're having struggles understanding, you can just ask your friend if they understand it and you, you can figure it out together. I don't know what that um, stumble was, but anyways, you can figure it out together. So I would really recommend you do that because it's just so much fun. Now, this was my very last tip. This was a very long video. I don't know how I'm gonna bring structure to this. I really, really hope I was able to give you some like starting points, some grip on how to read a classic. But honestly, my biggest, biggest tip, the, the most important thing is for you to realize that classics can be really fun and they don't have to be intimidating. They are only as intimidating as you make them out to be. 
Um, maybe making a step-to-step -step guide doesn't make them seem less intimidating, but I hope it did because I just hope that you will pick up the classic you've been wanting to read because I can promise you they will be worth your time, like they will be worth all of your effort because they're so fun and you so quickly get used to reading classics like after you've read a few it just feels like a normal book and there's a whole new world that opens when you start reading classics because there are all of these books that have been around for so long and there are so many books so many books have been written <laughs> um, and it's just so cool to be able to also read those and read something different and gain new perspectives on life and step into different worlds by reading classics and I just love them. I hope that that is clear from this video. So if you want any more tips, if you have any more questions or if you just want to talk about classics, please, please do that. Let's start a conversation about classics and reading in the comments because that's what we're here for after all, for the love of books and classics. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay reading and I'll see you next time. Bye!